Um, Ed, fr from the other side of the, the, what the orchestra does, I mean, so much of it is the concerts in Roy Thompson Hall for, for subscribers and, and sort of adult audiences. But there's a lot of, of children's stuff and educational stuff that, that the orchestra does. Yeah. It's something like 120,000 kids in Toronto get to experience the orchestra in concert or in some kind of workshop form. Yeah, that's, that's been our record. Um, um, you know, it never goes below 85,000. But our record was 120,000 kids hear the, the, the orchestra or hear members of the orchestra in schools. Um, we've done these tours to Northern Ontario now for, for five years in a row, I think, and uh, the last two I've done myself. And um, so we, we give concerts to in the communities like Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie, Thunder Bay, and so on, and then we give concerts for, like five or six concerts for students. I have to always do one in French. And uh, French is good. My French is uh, is okay <laughs> for that half an hour, um, but uh, and so it, no, it's it's really really important. Let's face it. I mean, I'm, I'm sure most of us who who love music were exposed relatively young, and it's it's so it's so important for us to to continue to do that. And then the soundcheck program, of course, is. Are you all familiar with this soundcheck program? It's, it started off 15 to 29 year olds, and they register on the internet. This is the secret to the success of this thing. It, a lot of orchestras have rush tickets for students, you know, $10. It, and the students come in and they give them the $10 and they get a ticket and nobody knows who they are. Well, in, the, in this age of the internet, you've got to know who they are. I mean, that's what it's all about, connecting, isn't it? And so the, the TSO was very quick on this and started this program, I think it's eight years ago. Oh, wow. And there's been, I don't know, 55, 60,000 members in its history. And there are about 17,000 active members of the Soundcheck program at any given time. So, so that's been really, really important. And, and I think, you know, for, for many of us who, who go to concerts, a lot. There's always this sense of, oh my goodness, well, where are all the young people? You know, in the, in the chamber music world, we used to say, oh, you know, our, our audience is uh, mainly retired people and, and their parents. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and now, you know, you go to the Toronto Symphony and you say, my God, this is fabulous. There's all this youthful energy around. So it's great. Well, last night, I think about half the audience would have been under age 40, I'm sure. Um, Eighth Blackbird were, were the guests, so they, I mean, they drew in, I think, probably a younger group yeah. as well. Yeah, Eighth Blackbird is a, a wonderful group. Uh, uh, this, actually, it's a sextet, but uh, piano, uh, percussion, clarinet, flute, violin, and cello. And they play almost everything they do. They play extremely complex music a lot of the time, and they play it almost all from memory and they choreograph it. It's just unbelievable. And this piece by Jennifer Higdon last night was quite sensational. I mean, can you imagine writing a, a concerto for those instruments and orchestra? And uh, I thought it was very, very brilliantly conceived. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, they would bring in quite a young crowd too, because it's a very, that's, they've got a cool reputation. Yeah, they do. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the older people I've spoken to over the years have said how they were introduced to the Toronto Symphony uh, by the concerts that the symphony used to give at Ontario Place in the summertime. But they, they would, it's kind of a favorite memory for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and this hasn't happened for a very long time. And for the last few years, the, the symphony was talking about setting up a festival with National Arts Centre Orchestra in Niagara. What happened that, to that? <laughs> what did happen to that? <laughs> um, and, and so I was wondering if there was a plan B that might actually involve something happening in Toronto in the future. Well, you know, the, the, there's nothing specific. Um, I think that we do deserve and need an amphitheater, but this is a huge subject because um, and I was just in Sydney for two weeks, and uh, I know that Sydney Harbour is very extraordinary, and, and uh, you know it's a lot more interesting just geographically and intrinsically than than our lakefront. But you know, uh, talk about a wasted opportunity. I mean, our lakefront is just a disaster, right? Let's face it. I mean, it, 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 the, some efforts are being made, but and there are huge plans in the works. But I, it's just such a shame that this city, which was was voted the fourth best city to live in just just mm -hmm. recently, and, and it is. I mean, I love Toronto. I think it's a great, great city. But it's such a shame that we don't have a more vibrant lakefront. And I I, I see this as being very likely to happen. I just hope it's during some of our lifetimes. That's all. You know, and, and there should be some kind of an amphitheater again, because I played at Ontario Place, 
And it was, it was wonderful. And you're absolutely right. A lot of people would come into Ontario, but you just played, paid a general admission. And you can go and hear wonderful concerts by the TSO and various other you know, performances that would go on. So it's, and we have actually quite nice summers. You know, I mean, I know we have very nice winters, you're thinking, <laughs> but, but, um, <laughs> but we, we, you know, the summers are, are fabulous. They're really conducive to an outdoor venue. And there, now, there's a plan to do something up North York. You yes, know, the, the uh, Black Creek Festival, which is starting up in June. Right, right. Uh, which will have the, the London Symphony and, and, and a special symphony orchestra, which is just pick up musicians. Mm -hmm. um, right. So we'll see how that goes. Um, at the Rexall Center, so that's York University-ish. Right. Um, but right. but I, those of us who don't like to go north of Bloor Street, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you a bit uncomfortable now? You're two yes, blocks yeah, uncomfortable, yeah, know, right? So. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I think it's a whole different thing, isn't it? But, but being up there, it would be really. You know, actually, when I was at the the, the David Miller's office about three years ago, um, we were talking about this amphitheater, and and they said, but it's in the plans. And, Oh, you know, you've heard that before, right? Uh, and and so they they went off and they got these plans, and it was terribly funny because they came down with the plans and said, "Oh, look, it's not there anymore." I said, "Well, what a surprise!" I said, "Well, there it is. I can see where it, it's been erased. <laughs> First thing to go, the amphitheater, you know." But um, you know, we have we have work to do still. I mean, you know, you you, ha you have to be very courageous sometimes. You, you say, "What what else do you do other than conduct?" I mean, that's one of the the many things that you you have to really believe in the importance of of motivating people to want to make a difference, and um, that would be a, a great example. I mean, in orchestras. You know, they always need to be supported, right? It's not just ticket sales. And even though we sell far more tickets than we used to, it's still we, we are dependent on the incredible generosity of wonderful patrons and benefactors and corporations in this city that, that make it possible. And when, and when I first turned up, you know, I, I would look at this city and I'd say, oh, and the, and the orchestra's bankrupt? How is that possible? You know, so, and you know, it was, it was just what I was saying. There is a, a huge opportunity to support the arts in, in Toronto. And I think, let's be fair, we've seen an in incredible amount of generosity in the last eight years. When you look at the structures that have come to our city, you know, with the, with the, the new, the museums and, and the, the Kerner Hall and the Four Seasons. And I, every time I go there, I just think, Richard, I wish you were here to, to have enjoyed this longer because what, what? Now there's a great example of somebody who just said this has to happen. He believed in it, he made it happen, and it's a great gift, a permanent gift to our city. Mm -hmm. do, you, do, you have, do you ever sort of think about a, a legacy project that, that you'd kind of like to leave as, as, as your legacy is from the, your time as director of the TSO? And I mean, I'm, and I'm not saying this thinking that, well, it's coming up soon, but you know, just. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because we, we had the renovation of the hall right before, and the hall is now extremely good. Um, a, a lot of musicians come, and they're very pleasantly surprised by how, how nice it is to play there. How it sounds well, but it feels extremely good. Um, so th th that, that isn't a real driving need. I think the legacy for me um, has to be on two levels. One is that artistically that you take the orchestra to a place where they gain a permanent self-respect, that they will, would never allow themselves to slip back. Um, and, and that happened, I, I agree with you that it happened, and it was largely morale, actually. It wasn't that there was a lack of ability in the orchestra, but the morale was very, very bad. And uh, sometimes an orchestra has good morale because people are supporting them so much and everything is, feels so good and the, the, uh, and, and the performance just start to take care of themselves. And sometimes the orchestra has to really look after themselves. It, it just goes like that. You never know. You know, a music director may leave. Um, anything can happen. And then the orchestra has to have that self-respect and that self-motivation to keep things solid. And that, that would be one aspect of, of my legacy, that I would feel that we'd taken ourselves to that stage where we would never let it slip back again. And the other aspect would be to, to more permanently solidify the, the financial backbone of the organization. Um, and we're on, we're on good footing, but it's not as solid as it, as it really genuinely needs to be. And there needs to be more engagement 
with with corporate Toronto, and uh, and and more follow up gifts to the the two or three very very generous ones that we've had, so that we can uh, we can build a really significant foundation. How much time? I mean, you're contracted to do twelve weeks with the Toronto Symphony, which is a typical music director's contract. Um, but in reality, it, I mean, it takes an awful lot more time than that doing non-musical stuff. How much time do you spend like talking to potential donors and talking to heads of corporations and so on? In the course of your well, a fair amount. You know, I, I mean, I actually I enjoy meeting people, as most of you probably know. I, I enjoy meeting people, and I enjoy talking about music and my passion for it and my passion for Toronto as a, as a great city and, and how significant it is for the city. Um, and so I, I do spend a lot of time, but I don't particularly notice it, actually. And the, the best thing that happened was that my, my wife agreed to bring the family to Toronto mm. in 2005. So my kids at that time were 14 and 13. Not the easiest moment to move uh, uh, kids, but um, we decided that it would be, it would make such a huge difference to the effect that I might be able to have as a music director. And then my wife um, got involved herself and she started this uh, series of, of evening sort of cocktail parties where it was her concept, meet the musicians, let's invite some people who love the symphony but aren't yet really close to the symphony to come to our home, have a lovely cocktail, we'll have four or five musicians and I will just talk to them and you know, interview each of them and let, let people find out who they are and spend the rest of the evening just chatting. And we did many, many of these and they were extremely effective. And so, and we had a real presence. So any week off that I had, I was very often in Toronto and available to, to have dinners with people and to go and have the meetings and, um, and to, you know, to, to meet with the mayor if necessary and, and so on. So you, you, you do need a music director that's, that's hands-on and has a commitment way beyond just the podium and, and all of the auditions and all of the musical side.